Okay, I believe we stopped here last time, right? Um, okay, have you recovered from last time's lecture? Okay, good. I hope you went home, you went over the notes, you made sense of the PowerPoint, right? Um, okay, so we talked about visual acuity um, a little bit last time, and what, did, uh, what do I mean by visual acuity? What does that mean? Yes? Yeah, so what does that mean? What does that translate to? Huh? The details that you can see. Exactly. And which photoreceptor, the cones or the rods, are specialized or have better at acuity than the other one? Cones. The cones, exactly. Okay? So they're much better at acuity, but they're worse at what? Meaning that the rods are better at it. Sensitivity, yes, at sensitivity, exactly, okay? Now, the fovea, which happens to be the center of the retina, the very center of the retina, is packed with cones. So, if you want to see something with high details, meaning that it has to be during the day because you would need light, because the cones are not sensitive, you would stare right at it. But how about at night time? If you need to see, let's say, for example, the stars or a shooting star in the sky, what should you do? Should you stare right at it? No. To the side. Exactly. And why is that? Exactly. The rods are in the periphery, and, um, in, uh, and the periphery or the rods can see in dim light or has higher sensitivity, so it can see in very low amounts of light. Okay? So uh, is it clear the difference between acuity and sensitivity? Okay, so let's see what that looks like physically. So here is a picture of the retina. You see that's a dense orange uh, part in the middle. That's the fovea. And if you see um, where that correlates here to the bottom, you see that there's a high number of the cone right in the middle of the fovea. See that the peak of the red line? Okay. And then as soon as you get outside the fovea, now the outside the fovea or the x-axis is in degrees, because you think of it as a circle, yeah? Mm -hmm. So zero degrees would be the center or the fovea, okay? And then plus 20 or minus 20 would be just outside the center. So you see that, you know, from zero is the highest density of cones, okay? The red line, the peak of the red line, and there is zero rods. You see that? You see this? The blue line? You see that? Like an inverted peak all the way to zero. And then as you go outside the fovea, you see that the cones uh, pretty abruptly are reduced to almost nothing, okay, plus or minus 20 degrees. And then you see another peak on both sides develop for the blue line, and you see that the rods are much, much more concentrated in the periphery or besides the center. Okay? And then the middle panel you have the blue and the red cells. You see that the um, middle panel, the red one, is densely packed with cells. Like just tons of cones, de very densely packed in the fovea. And then the two um, rectangles, I guess, on the right and the left, you see that the cells are more spread out, less dense. Okay? So these physiological differences indeed correlate with behavioral differences in terms of what you could see. Right? All right, so here's visual acuity across the retina. Um, again, on the x-axis, you have zero being the fovea, and then the, uh, uh, um, in degrees away from the zero, okay? Uh, nasal side versus the temporal side. So here's temporal, here's nasal. And then um, on the y-axis, you have percentage of acuity uh, relative to foveal, because foveal would be 100% acuity, right? Do we all agree? Foveal would be 100% acuity. So how much acuity relative to foveal, that's going to be our y-axis. So you see that 100% acuity, meaning you're right in the fovea, is zero. That's what you exactly would expect. And acuity decreases, not gradually, pretty sharply, uh, when you deviate from the zero point or from the fovea. You see that? Now, you're also noticing, and you're probably thinking in your head, but you haven't woken up yet, so you're not asking, 
what's going on there? Why is there a discontinuation um, in the figure there? What, what is going on there? A 20 positive 20. What's going on there on the nasal side? On the nasal positive 20. Or not positive, but nasal 20. It's where the optic nerve goes back. Exactly. So that part does not have any photoreceptors. It doesn't have cones. It doesn't have rods. It doesn't have acuity or sensitivity. Okay? Meaning that if an image falls on that part, it won't, you won't see anything. Right? You need photoreceptors to see. If an area doesn't have photoreceptors, you simply don't see. Okay, so here is um, another schematic uh, representation of what the retina looks like. Again, we discussed at length last time that the retina is inverted, and we talked about why that is and, and so forth. Um, so the light is coming from the other side, and all the way at the back, which actually is the first site where light has to be interpreted in the language that the nervous system would understand, a process called transduction. transduction exactly. Okay, so you have here the rods and the cones all the way at the back, and the photopigment layer. Um, and then you see that there is this um, uh, indentation in the center, the phobia. Okay? So we talked about the photoreceptors, the cones and the rods, the bipolar cells, which is the first synapses between the photoreceptors and the bipolar, and then the second synapse between the bipolar and the ganglia, right? And then we talked about um, cells that go laterally, so between each synapse. And those cells were called horizontal, horizontal cells. And then the other ones? It starts with an A. Starts with an a. If, if there is a multiple choice test, yes, you can get that right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's a good, oh, I should make all of them start with an A. Thank you. Appreciate that. Don't worry, it's not all or no. So what is it? Anacron cells, okay? All right. So the optic disc is basically where that empty area was, which is all the blood vessels and the axons of the ganglia cells, which are actually in the front of the eye, which is the last site of processing, have to leave that, have to leave that, the, the eye and have to go into in the, the brain. We call that the optic disc. Now, as I, so how do you think nature would solve that dilemma? So you have axons of the ganglion cells that need to go to the brain to take this transduced information so the brain can make sense of it, correct me so I'm standing um, uh, right upright and you can see me in three dimension, all of that stuff. And you also have blood vessels. Okay? So all of that needs to leave the back of the eye. How do you, how do you suppose nature would solve that? How, how would that happen? What would it do? No, no, I, I want physically, mechanically, how would, how would it actually leave the back of the eye? What would it do? Yeah, like I want you to give me a mechanical mechanism how all the stuff leaves the back of the eye. It makes a hole and it leaves. So there's actually like in the back, there's no photoreceptors in that area because it needs to be. Okay, very simple. Which would do exactly what you said, which is that you wouldn't be able to see in that area. And that is your blind spot. So if you remember when you first uh, learned how to drive, the big thing about driving is where is your blind spot? Find your blind spot. Um, so you're, some of you are laughing, so you're remembering that. Um, so that's something that you have to always be aware of. Do you have to always be aware of that? Like, I don't know, have you noticed um, that there is, because obviously you have two blind spots, one in the right eye and one in the left eye, right? Because you have gangway and axons and, and blood vessels in the back of both eyes. Have you ever noticed that, because there's no photoreceptors there, that there are bl two black holes following you everywhere? Has anyone ever noticed that? Are you guys serious? <laughs> You've never noticed two back like holes where there's like no information because that that would be the equivalent of no photoreceptors. You should see absolutely nothing, darkness, nothing. Have you seen that? Have you noticed that? Thank God. Okay, because I always have one person in the class is like, yeah, I've seen that, and I always worry 
what do I do? What are my ethical responsibilities beyond this point? Do I face them with the fact that they potentially have schizophrenia, or do I just like uh, continue with the lecture? So thankfully, all of you guys are fine. How do you think then the brain corrects for that? Because the reality is, physically, you should see two black holes. That's what you should see. But you're not seeing that. So there's obviously some sort of correction where the brain is fooling you into thinking this is a continuous white wall, but it's not. How do you think the brain corrects for that? Kind, exactly. And also, like, you are blinking all the time and your eye moving, your, your saccadic eye movement makes the eyes, uh, the blind spot move so much that you can easily fill in. Okay? But um, there, there is an exercise you can do in your book where you can find out your blind spot where, like, the circle would completely disappear. But what you see is a continuation of the sheet instead of just a black hole. Okay? This is not the only trick or illusion your brain plays with you. The brain is so good with playing all kinds of illusions with you. So really what you see out there in the world is never reality. Okay? And that's what I tell people, I'm like, there's always, there's your side, you're not lying. His side, he's not lying too, because if someone thinks, well, if I'm not lying, then he is, or she is. Um, and then there's reality, there's the truth. Okay? So um, your brain plays with you all kinds of illusions, that th the reality that you're seeing it might not be the physical reality that's actually there. Okay? Okay, so, the, then you, so you have these neural signals that travel then from the back of the eye, the retina, you have all the axons of the ganglion cells, right, the only cells that can actually conduct action potentials, right, okay, then they're going to um, gather together and they're going to make the optic nerve, exactly, okay, and they're going to, um, uh, uh, these axons are going to go then into the primary cortical area for vision in the brain, and every single sensory modality for the auditory, uh, for olfactory, for all of the different sensory um, modalities, you have a primary cortical area. For vision, um, the primary cortical area, or visual area, is located in the occipital uh, cortex, all the way here in the back. Okay. Now, the optic nerve, on its way to the occipital lobe, or the occipital cortex, crisscrosses. Okay? What we call the optic chiasm, because chiasm means X. Once it crisscrosses, the, the uh, axons that lead beyond the chiasm are no longer called optic nerves, are now called optic tracts. So before the optic chiasm, optic nerve, beyond the optic chiasm, optic tract. They're the same thing. They're the same um, ganglionic axons. So I kind of, I don't know if you remember in the 90s where people came up with all kinds of working workshops, find out your best learning style, whether you're visual or auditory. The thing is, though, all of us are visual learners. Okay. Because over like 80% of your brain is dedicated to processing uh, vision or visual information. So here are some of the areas we're going to talk about today, uh, or also next probably and Wednesday also, that are involved in vision. So here, we, uh, last time we began with number one, which is the retina image is inverted um, and then reversed left to right and the back of the eye, the retina, and then the axons, and then, uh, and then we talked about the synapses going from the photoreceptors to the bipolar to the ganglion, and then we talked about the axons of the ganglion cells forming the optic nerves, we talked about all of that, and then we talked about the optic chiasm crisscrossing. Now, the optic chiasm, or the, uh, not all of the axons crisscross, right? Not all of them crisscross. A portion of them <coughs> does not crisscross, means that it goes to the ipsilateral side of the brain. 
What does that mean? Ipsi lateral side of the brain. What does that mean? Same side. Hmm? Same, same side. side. Ipsi means same side. We did that in chapter two, I think. Okay. So the um, axons that are uh, closer to the temporal area, closer to the ears, do not crisscross. They stay on the same side of the epsilateral. So the, the information then goes to the epsilateral side. The information that is in the middle or the nasal axons crisscross. Now the percentage of how many axons crisscross and how many go epsilateral um, are actually different from one species to another. So humans are going to be different than rabbits. Okay. Which means that your visual experience will be different than rabbits. Okay. A rabbit's visual field is much wider. You could be standing over there and like, how did, how did the bunny see me? I was trying to like catch it. Right? Uh, but with humans, the visual field is much, it's a little bit more narrow. Because the rabbit has its eyes more on the side. Okay, so all of that, whatever physiologically or physically is being going on in your brain or at the retina level is going to be correlated with how you see things in the environment. Okay, um, and then most of the axons, meaning of the ganglion cells, that made up the optic tract, because now we're talking beyond the optic chiasm, are going to terminate on, um, in an area called the lateral genaculate nucleus in the thalamus. Again, every single sensory modality is going to have its own dedicated nucleus in the thalamus that it has to go through before going to its primary cortical area. For the visual system, it's called LGN or lateral genaculate nucleus. Now, yes, most of the axons are going to go to the LGN and they're going to go to the, the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe, but there is a um, smaller range of axons that instead of going to the occipital, goes to the superior colloquius in the midbrain. Now, you have axons that are sent back and forth between the lateral genaculate nucleus and the striate cortex, or what's called the primary visual cortex, we'll talk about that at length, via what's called optical radiation. So this wider part of the nucleus. Now, in humans, most of the primary visual cortex cells are located on the medial side. It's a little bit different in other species. Um, so in monkeys, it might be actually more lateral. Again, that will correspond to how you experience things. Now, the left primary visual cortex actually gets input from the right visual field. The right uh, uh, visual cortex will get information from the left visual field. From both eyes. Okay. Let me unpack that a little bit because it's kind of confusing. I just told you that, you know what, nearly half will crisscross and the other will stay on the same side. So you're thinking, well, how does that work? Well, think about an image that gets projected on your retina. Right? So you have here, think about one eye. Um, you have the side that's closest to the ear, the side that's closer to the nose. Um, you have the visual field, field, and it gets vice versa, right? So the right visual field here is going to be projected on the left. The left visual field is going to be projecting on the right. Okay. So the eye, the back of the eye, from both eyes is going to take information from the left visual field from this eye, the right eye, and from the left eye, and that information will get processed in the right hemisphere. 
And then the right visual field, so the right half of everything. So hold on. So this would be this would be my visual field. I can't see beyond my two hands. So if there's a line in the middle, like from here, this would be my right visual field. This would be my left visual field. Both eyes appreciate some of the right visual field, some of the left visual field. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so the right visual field from both eyes, because both eyes there's a right visual field, is going to be processed by the left hemisphere. Does that make sense? So as we said, most of the axons from the optic tract um, on their way to the primary visual cortex stop in the thalamus in a dedicated visual nucleus called the lateral genaculate nucleus. Okay. The axons of the lateral genaculate nucleus, um, they go back and forth between uh, uh, there and the primary visual cortex in what's called, or through what's called, optic radiation that I showed you on the previous slide. We're just saying the same thing, but now in words. And we're going to call the first spot in the occipital lobe, or, uh, or visual cortical area in the occipital lobe, V1. Visual 1. And sometimes it's called the striate cortex. You should know both names. So when I say V1, really I mean the striate cortex. When I say the striate cortex, really I mean V1. And the reason why it's called striate cortex is because it appears striped. Because we do have two eyes. Now, visual cortices outside V1, we're still in the occipital lobe, and we go beyond that, as you will see later on in the chapter, um, are called extra striate cortex. That makes sense. Beyond the striate to be called extra striate cortex, that, that makes sense. Any questions so far? So here's um, a monkey's um, uh, cortical areas that has been kind of like flattened, okay? where the center here is the fovea, and here is a human brain, um, uh, more like a, a schematic representation of the visual cortex um, in humans. So here um, in the monkey, they see light. You see that the fovea, the red part, um, has what kind of portion? Or oh, sorry, that's V1. That's V1. Now I believe that the red, the red part is the phobia, right? If you're the caption of the graph, I'm pretty sure the red part is the phobia. Okay, so um, that part is much more represented than the rest of the areas. Okay. <coughs> Which you would expect. You would expect that from all the information we um, uh, I prefaced talking about the phobia, acuity, the number of cones. You would expect that it would be overrepresented in the visual area. I think that's a normal thing that follows from that. Does that make sense? Okay. So the foveal area, both in the monkey and humans, is going to be overrepresented in the cortex. What I mean by that is that you have a bigger area of the visual cortical areas representing vision or information from the fovea. Okay? And also the other remarkable thing here is that the fovea is actually small but it's overrepresented by the cortex, meaning there's a much bigger area in the uh, V1 representing the fovea, even though the fovea is actually small. Does that make sense? 
And we've talked about this idea before that if you have more cortical tissue um, dedicated to something, uh, that gets overrepresented. Okay. Just like I demonstrated a minute ago, the whole area that you see is called your visual field. Now, the retina represents everything in two dimensions, and your brain is the one that corrects that and makes you see me in three dimensions instead of just two-dimensional. Now, what's very neat about the eye, and actually not just the eye, the ear too, and your other sensory modalities, is that it's topographically presented, meaning that the um, layout of the environment um, is presented kind of the same way in the brain. So neighboring fields in the, in the environment are represented by neighboring neurons in the brain. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So if I, let's say I'm looking at something over there and a contiguous point next to it, they're probably or they're for sure represented and being processed by neurons that are close to each other also in the back of the eye, in the thalamus, and V1. We call that topographic representation. If I'm looking at one point here all the way in the east, one all the way west, they're going to be represented by neurons in the brain that are very far away from each other. We call that topographic representation. And just like in monkeys, humans also have um, a lot of areas uh, or a big portion of V1 representing the foveal vision. And that's why you can see with acuity um, um, any image that's projected on your fovea. Okay. Now, because you have a retinotopic mapping or topographic mapping, you can actually uh, predict what a person is going to fail to see, okay, or scotoma, kind of like that black hole that you have naturally, but sometimes people have more than the two, in each, the one in each eye, okay, as a result of some uh, pathologies. So you can predict, well, if it's going to fall in this part of the map, that they're going to fail to see the corresponding uh, part of the world. An interesting phenomenon that is very rare, that, ha that has been, um, uh, that has happened, it's called blind sight. You know, it's kind of weird to have blind sight. Okay. Um, and this is the inability to actually consciously perceive visual cues, but yet you're able to do visual discrimination. So let me make it, let me demonstrate this. Here's my glasses, here's my big bottle of water, okay? Um, let's say I can't. Let's say you're gonna throw this at me. Okay, if I'm gonna catch it, even though I'm failing to see it, I'm gonna catch it like this. Okay. If you throw my glasses at me, I'm gonna catch it like this. Did you see the change of my hand grip? It was much wider for my bottle of water. It was much narrower for my glasses. But I can't see them. Does that does that make sense? Okay. So consciously, I cannot report to you that I'm perceiving them, but I am reacting with the proper motor grip, with my hand being wider for my bo bottle of water and more narrow for my glasses or a pen or whatever that's a small object. Yes? Do you have to know that, you're going to, that the wire bottle is going to be thrown at you in order to know that you're going to? No, not really. No, not really. Because what if you don't know what's coming at you? You feel that something is coming at you, though. That's, but you can't report this verbally. So the conscious um, aspect is not there. Does that make sense? But your reaction, your reaction to it is there. Okay. Okay, which shows something very important about vision, and that is that they're represented by different parts of the brain, that they're independent. Now the next slide is not going to be the funnest slide 
because just like I said, uh, uh, we started with the retina where everything was inverted, also neurotransmission or the chemicals being released is also kind of inverted. So how that happens is at rest, when the photoreceptors are not being stimulated, um, what you have is you have a steady release of neurotransmitter. Kind of it goes against a little bit what we learned in chapter four. Okay. So at rest, you have this continuous release of neurotransmitter, and the neurotransmitter here is glutamate. And because glutamate is excitatory, well, it's then going to depolarize the next cells, and that would be what? So photoreceptors not being activated, they're going to continuously uh, release uh, glutamate, which will then excite the next cells, which is what? The bipolar cells, exactly. Okay? Now here's the part that's not fun, okay? Is that glutamate, which I, you could have sworn that I said this in one of the lectures, is always excitatory. I partly like a little bit, because there's some exception in the visual field, in the visual um, uh, cortex. And that is, glutamate depolarizes a group of bipolar cells, meaning that the glutamate chemical message is interpreted by a group of bipolar cells as excitatory, but it's interpreted by another group of bipolar cells as inhibitory. So it will, glutamate will depolarize a group of bipolar cells, and it will hyperpolarize another group of bipolar cells. These are just neurons that that is their typical reaction to glutamate always. One is always excited by glutamate, and then one is always inhibited by glutamate. Depolarization, hyperpolarization. It's really important that you understand this before we look at the next slide. Now, the receptive field, which is the area that um, that cell is activated by, is going to differ for these two cells or these two groups of cells, the one that gets turned on by glutamate and the one that gets turned off by glutamate, bipolar cells. Okay. What's called on-center bipolar uh, cells. So if you think of the receptive field as uh, this area in the environment that activates the neuron, the center of it will be the center. On-center bipolar cells means that turning on the light, so exciting the cell, turning on the light, actually excites the cell. How does that happen? Because typically, for the on-center bipolar cells, glutamate is inhibitory. Okay, so I'm getting confused now. So if I'm telling you that typically glutamate is inhibitory, how is it that's getting excited? Can somebody unpack that for me? What does that mean? So, what, so now the light is going to shine on this group of cells that's called on center. So if it's shining on the center because it's called on center, meaning the light has to hit the center of the receptive field, then what's happening? They get excited. They get excited, exactly. Right? They get excited. And if they get excited, what's happening to the photoreceptors? Are they releasing more glutamate or less glutamate? Getting both answers. Then releasing less glutamate. Remember, when the photoreceptors are continually releasing glutamate when they're not activated. Now I'm telling you, you have light, which is the stimulus, that's going to then activate the cells or excite them. Okay? Now, light is going to excite the photoreceptor, meaning that it's going to. Remember I showed you that graph of dim light is a little bit of hyperpolarization. Intermediate light is a lot more hyperpolarization. Intense light is maximum hyperpolarization. What that means chemically down there at the axon is that you don't have release of neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter glutamate. 
Okay, so are you with me so far? Okay, so then you're not getting glutamate or you're getting a reduction in the release of glutamate on the bipolar cells that happen to be that happen to be inhibited by glutamate. So if it typically is inhibited by glutamate, now I'm reducing the amount of glutamate, it's now free to actually excite the next cell. Does that make sense? There's, there's, a, there's a series of like plus, minus, plus, minus, and I know that's confusing. But think about it slowly and mechanically you'll get it. So now because these on-center bipolar cells are getting less glutamate as a result of excitation uh, uh, by the light, then it actually is free to be to excite the next cell. Okay? So in the absence of light, in the absence of light, when the photoreceptors are not activated, glutamate is released and it inhibits these on central bipolar cells. Okay? When the light is present, only for this group of on central bipolar cells, it reduces the amount of glutamate, which is inhibitory on these on center cells, mm -hmm. then it reduces inhibition, so it's more, it has a more excitatory effect. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now remember how I said there's two groups of bipolar cells, ones that are inhibited by glutamate. Now we know instead of saying a group of bipolar cells, we're going to call them on center bipolar cells. The other group called off-center bipolar cells is going to be the group that gets excited by glutamate. Okay? So let's do the same exercise again. So here you have, you turn on the light in the center, which means that you have a reduction of glutamate, but this glutamate is interpreted by these cells as excitatory. Yes? This glutamate here is interpreted as an excitatory message. Reduction of that would mean inhibition of the bipolar cells. So there is less signal going on to activate the next ganglion cells. So they don't fire. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so let's, oh, I'm going to say the same thing over again. I'm sure you won't be bored when I say it ten times. Uh, but using now the schematic representation. Um, so here you have the center illuminated. Okay, so again, you're thinking of a visual field. You have the center of it illuminated. And what I'm saying is that when the center is illuminated, for some bipolar cells, it has an excitatory effect. For some, it has an inhibitory effect. For the on-center, it's inhibitory. For the off-center, I'm sorry. For the uh, though this is not confusing enough. For the on-center, it's um, excitatory. For the off-center, it's inhibitory. Okay. So let's let's do this. So here you have the cones or whatever. Okay. Um, you have a cell. Uh, you have uh, a stimulus which is uh, illumination or light on the center of that visual field. As a result of that, you're going to have decrease in the amount of glutamate being released. Hmm? Well, so what happens is, okay, so we have two types of cells. We have on-center and we have off-center. Okay, these are the bipolar cells. And then the step before that is you have the photoreceptors. And the photoreceptors are continually releasing glutamate with, in the absence of stimulus. And the stimulus for the visual system is light. So in darkness, when there's no light, the photoreceptors are continually releasing glutamate. That's what they're doing. Now you shine the light on the center of the visual field, on the receptive field, and two bipolar cells will react in opposite ways. Okay. okay, so let's begin with the photoreceptors. The photoreceptors will release less glutamate. Now, this decreasing glutamate will have opposite effect on the on center cells and on the off center cells. 
The reason being that the glutamate is interpreted chemically differently by the on center and by the off center. So the on center cell it sees glutamate as inhibitory. So the off center cell it sees glutamate as excitatory. All right, so here you have, uh, typically this glutamate is released, so the on-center cell, when it's dark, is not activated. But now that you have light, you have less glutamate being released by the photoreceptor, you ease that inhibitory mechanism because you're deleting or you're decreasing the amount of glutamate, right? So then the bipolar cell, the on-center bipolar cell, is going to be excited because you took away the inhibitory mechanism that was holding it back. Thus, you get an increase in the neurotransmitter release, the red dots, which means that it will excite the ganglion cell in firing an action potential. Okay, so take a second and just kind of like understand what I just said. So I want you to follow it from photoreceptor all the way, and if you can't get the increased firing rate of the ganglion itself, you need to let me know before I explain the off-center. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to assume we're cool. Okay. So now let's see what happens on the right side to the off-center bipolar cells, beginning again from the photoreceptors. The photoreceptor step is always the same. Okay. You're going to get light. As a result of that, you're going to decrease the amount of glutamate being released. Glutamate is interpreted by off-center cells as excitatory. So when you take away this excitatory mechanism by releasing less glutamate, that's kind of like saying inhibition. You're taking away excitation. What that means is it's going to release less glutamate, which means that it's going to lead to decreased firing rate of the off-center ganglion cell. Okay, so do the same thing from photoreceptor to ganglia and see if you can arrive at decreased firing rate. Okay, any questions? <coughs> yes. <coughs> Things that are true for rods too are just phones. Well, for, for rods, yes. For now, yes. Okay. <laughs> for now, yes. Well, let's not add another layer of complexity. For now, yes. Kind of. Again, the pathway begins with shining the light on center, on the center of the visual field or the, or the receptive visual field. Because it's a different story, you shine the light off center. 
I'm going to talk about that, but make sure that you digest this really well first <coughs> before I add another layer of complexity. <coughs> What one? Yes, yes, yes. So these two bipolar cells, the on center and the off center, are going to react in opposite ways to glutamate. One will cease as excitatory, one will cease as inhibitory. Okay. So, um, Really, on the test, you have to really understand this. Because like I said last time, the visual chapter or vision chapter, there isn't a lot of memory stuff, but there's tons of conceptual stuff. So you need to understand how you can go from illuminating the center, okay, and what impact would that have on an on-center ganglion cell? What impact would that have on off-center ganglion cells? Which means that you would have to do some mental calculations of these two steps in your brain. Okay? So bipolar cells, okay, again saying the same thing kind of in words, bipolar cells are going to release glutamate. Okay. Now here is the thing. So remember earlier I said that glutamate, um, for the uh, bipolar cells, there's a group that's excited by glutamate and there's a group that's inhibited by glutamate. On center, off center. Has different effects. Now you might be asking, well, bipolar cells are going to release a chemical. I said that, right? So, because that's how it's going to communicate with, bipolar, with the ganglion cells. Right? It's done chemically by the release of neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter that's released by the bipolar cell is also glutamate. Is also glutamate. Now, the ganglion cells always interpret this glutamate as excitatory. So, it's a ganglion cell that glutamate that's being released is always going to be excitatory, even if it came from a bipolar cell that interpret, sorry, from an onset of cell, uh, bipolar cell, that interprets glutamate as inhibitory. Does that make sense? Yes. Sure. So, the second synapse, which is between the bipolar cell, you have the on center and the off center, to ganglion cell, the second synapse, is going to also be um, happening via chemical. A neurotransmitter. This neurotransmitter is also glutamate. Now, glutamate is interpreted by the ganglion cells as always excitatory or always uh, is depolarizing the ganglion cells. Even if that message came from on center bipolar cells that are typically inhibited by glutamate. So they're the only weird ones then, the on center. But now we're back to normal. Um, I think I'm going to challenge that by presenting other weird things in the lecture. <laughs> but I guess for now you can say that. Okay. Okay. The visual system is kind of um, differently abled. Okay. You have the inverted retina. You have the um, all these negative things. So it's, it is a little bit challenging. But you know what? If you mechanically, step by step, think about it, you'll always arrive at the right answer. You can't memorize. Okay? <coughs> yes? So glutamate, uh, glutamate always has this exception, right? Glutamate what? Always has this exception. But uh, really, glutamate is like 99% of the time excitatory. Okay? But in the visual system, and only the bipolar cell, you have this group that actually interprets glutamate as inhibitory. But other than that, in the remaining subsequent lectures, always assume glutamate is excitatory. So beyond the next step, just think glutamate is excitatory. <laughs> so on-center bipolar cell, 
are going to lead to exciting on-centered ganglion cells when the light is turned on and shining on the center, just like I showed you in the previous slide. Off-centered bipolar cells are going to excite off-center when the light is turned off. Can you think about that a little bit? So the off-center bipolar cells, which are excited by glutamate, yeah, they're actually going to excite off-center ganglion cells when the light is turned off. To think about the photoreceptor when the light is turned off, what that means. Okay, so the receptive fields of the ganglion cells, the retina ganglion cells, are what's called concentric, meaning that you have a circle and then you have a bigger circle around it. The central area is that when I said on center, I meant that the light will shine on center on that small circle. The surround um, uh, means that uh, when I say off-center, okay, that means that the light is not shining on the center. Now, I promised you guys that I'm going to add another layer of complication. I don't want to go back on my promise, so here it is. Okay, you have what's called on-center, off-surround. By on, I mean light shining on the center. Not on the surround, that's what offset and surround means. And then you have what's called off center, meaning there's no light on the center. On surround, the light is shining away from the center or in the bigger circle. So surround is not the center? No. You have the small circle, which is the center, and then around it, you have the surround. So light that's not here, anywhere here, is called on surround. Light that's here is called on center. Now, the effect in terms of what the effect on the ganglion cell for the center and its surround are always going to be opposite, or they're always going to be antagonistic. So let's take the first example, and uh, you have the receptive field, you have on center, so meaning that the light is shining on center, off surround, meaning that there's no light on the surround. Okay, so only the center is illuminated, in other words. The bipolar cell is going to be, um, by, uh, if it's an on center cell, it's going to be depolarized which will translate into action potentials in the ganglion cell because it's an on-center uh, bipolar cell, as I showed you earlier two slides ago. Okay. Now, um, when you have a spot of the light in the center, like it's best if you have the entire center illuminated. But if you only have a spot, the bigger that spot is covered the center, the bigger the depolarization. Okay. Now, if you have a spot of light that is actually on the surround and not the center, then that's going to hyperpolarize the bipolar cell, which means that less glutamate is going to be released. Less glutamate is always interpreted by the ganglion cell as inhibitory, so you get, you get a detriment or a reduction in the action potential in the ganglion cells. Each of these lines are action potentials. 
in the game winning count. So you see here that during the light, that there is the number of action potentials has re reduced to like two. Okay. Now, if you had the entire center illuminated, that's the best kind of stimulation, you're going to have an even higher excitation or depolarization. Yes, the amplitude of this here in the third example is higher than in the first example. Which means that the entire center is illuminated. What does that mean for the ganglion cell? Even more action potentials than, than in the first example where you had also action potentials, but you have many more action potentials here. Okay? We already said they're antagonistic, the center and the surround. So if you have the surround illuminated, okay, what happens is that you get hyperpolarization. How that's interpreted by the by, by the ganglion cell is by a decrease, big decrease in the amount uh, the number of action potentials. Okay? If you how, what happens if you illuminate both the center and the surround, so the entire thing is illuminated, um, they kind of cancel each other out. So you get maybe you know the length of what that would be something like this, where you have the same number of action potentials uh, when the light is on and when the light is off. Yeah. They are. They are. So and that so here is the surround being activated. You see this. It's the near opposite of the one above it where only the center is illuminated. You see that? Complete depolarization, complete hyperpolarization. Oh, okay. Does that, that antagonistic, they have antagonistic effects. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this kind of um, profile here is one for the on center of surround sound. Okay? So remember, the on center cells the bipolar cells are the ones that are typically inhibited by glutamate. Meaning, if you do something to release that glutamate, you actually have an excitatory effect on that ganglion cell. Okay? On center cells are the ones or the group of cells that are inhibited by glutamate. So if you can do anything to reduce the amount of glutamate, you actually excite them. That anything is actually shining light on the center, precisely this. Right? Because shining light on the center of the photoreceptor is going to reduce the hyperpolarization or reduce the amount of uh, um, glutamate being released. It's going to reduce the amount of glutamate being released because the glutamate is continuously being released in the dark. Right? You shine light on the center for this type of cell, you get a reduction in the glutamate being released by the photoreceptor. For the on center cell, that's kind of a less inhibition because it's typically inhibited by glutamate. Which means that it's now free to release glutamate because it's no longer inhibited by the continuous release of glutamate. What that means to the ganglion cell that now it's getting increased its firing rate, or the number of action potentials. Yes? Is this, um, is this just one, like, one cell? Like the center is like one cone that we're talking about, or is there a bunch of them? So each cone is going to have its own receptive field. So you have a cone, and then it, so the, the center is the cone, and then the surround is its own surround? No, this is what you actually, uh, oh. like out there in the environment, what they're actually doing to stimulate the cell. They're shining. So what's how they do it is that they have an electrode to eavesdrop on a cell in the visual cortex. Mm -hmm. And they kind of like move light around to figure out it is its receptive field. As soon as they hear action potentials, oh, here's the receptive field. Oh, I see. Okay. Then they figure it out, here's the receptive field. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So here's the receptive field, now let's shine light. And that's how they figure it out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now for this on center cell, if you shine light, uh, uh, the more you're away from the center, you tend to subtract from this depolarization, you get hyperpolarization, or you cancel it out. Does that make sense? 
is you're going to have on center, off surround, you're going to have off center, on surround, and like all the four different combinations. Okay? Does this make sense? Okay, so here is the same idea for an off-center, on-surround cell. Now, as a little reminder, the off-center bipolar cells are excited by glutamate. <coughs> So the opposite is going to happen. When you have the light shining on the center, you actually get the opposite of the uh, what I just showed you, where you get actually hyperpolarization, a decrease in the action potentials for ganglion cells. Okay. Because the cell is turned on by light in the surround. And that's why it's called off-center on surround. So when the center is dark, that's when you get depolarization in the cell, which is the bipolar cell. And depolarization in the bipolar cell, meaning more glutamate being released, is always interpreted by the ganglion cell as an increase in action potential or excitation. If you illuminate the entire center, you get an even stronger hyperpolarization than if you illuminate a part of the center, which is interpreted by the ganglion cell as no excitation, no action potentials. Maximum stimulation for this cell is going to come from illuminating the entire surround, while the center is dark. That will lead to maximum depolarization, which means that an, an increase in the action potential in the ganglion cells. Okay, same idea. If you illuminate both the center and the surround, you get basically a nut sum of nothing. Okay, so think about that for a second. <coughs> and then when you're looking at this, remember that off and a center of ganglia, bipolar cells are excited by glutamate from the photoreceptors. Okay, I just got a little bit confused. So in the just a little bit? You're in a good shape. You're in a good shape, I have to say. <laughs> So both excitation or depolarization and hyperpolarization will occur for both sides. Both sides. But it depends on which part of the receptive field you're shining the light. For the on center of the round cell, if you shine the light on the center, you get that cell excited. But if you do the same thing for this cell, the off center, you get the cell not excited or inhibited or hyperpolarized. For the, you're welcome. For the on-center cell, if you shine the light on the surround, you get the cell, uh, you reduce the number of action potential in the ganglia. While for this cell, you actually increase the number of action potentials in the ganglia. So they're opposites. Yeah? What happens to glutamate when you said when the center is dark, it depolarizes? It depends on which cell. On the off-center. So in the off-center cell, when, what's illuminated? The, the surround. The surround is illuminated, then you actually get max, if the entire surround is illuminated, you get maximum depolarization. What does that mean for the, for the ganglion cell? An increase in action potential. Okay, and what happens to the glutamate in the ganglion cell? So that means that it's receiving a lot of glutamate. 
The no, uh, increase in action potentials mean that it's receiving a lot of Boolean weight. That's a good question. Does that make sense? Okay. So the more Boolean weight it's receiving, the uh, ganglion cell, the more action potentials it's going to find. And that happens, the maximal action potential is going to fire is going to happen when? For the off-center cell, when the entire surround is illuminated. For the on-center cell, that will happen when the entire center is illuminated. <coughs> yeah. Is that just for the off-center or is that for both of them? Like so, glutamate, the effect of glutamate on the ganglion cells, remember that the, the, the final step in the retina pathway before it goes into the brain, mm -hmm. is always going to be excitatory. So, an increase in glutamate release on the uh, ganglion cells, it doesn't matter what, was the, what were the previous steps, it's always going to be excitatory. Okay? Does that make sense? I think I'm going to stop here because I feel sorry for you guys. <laughs> um, but I'll take questions meanwhile if you have any questions. <laughs>